Welcome to the lecture for research methods. Uh, we'll be talking now about data analysis and data analysis and interpretation. Uh, we'll talk about a couple of things: how to choose a statistical test for your study, what to consider when interpreting the results of data analysis, uh, and finally, what information to include in the last two sections of your paper. Uh, so, starting off, let's talk a little bit about choosing a test, and we'll start with kind of one group of instances when you're interested in looking at the difference between groups on one continuous dependent variable. Uh, so first let's think, well, what is a continuous dependent variable versus a discrete or categorical dependent variable? Continuous means uh, it can take on an infinite number of values and you can think of it there being, uh, you can have more of it, uh, more of the dependent variable or less of the dependent variable versus uh, a discontinuous or categorical dependent variable where the dependent variable can be one thing or another, or another. They can be different, but not different amounts, right? So qualitative differences. Uh, so if, if I were looking at, um, you know, what diagnosis will someone uh, give uh, after reading a vignette if they were trained either by a psychodynamic uh, professor or a behavioral professor? So theoretical orientation of the professor is my independent variable, and then what diagnosis the person or the participants give is my dependent variable, and what diagnosis isn't continuous, right? You can't have more or less of major depression versus borderline personality disorder. It's either they said major depressive disorder or they said borderline personality disorder. It's one or the other. So that would be an example of something that wasn't a continuous dependent variable, and the test we'll talk about here on, on this page wouldn't apply to. Uh, now if I change it to, um, uh, if I give a, a certain vignette that um, is from a patient who really did have major depressive disorder, uh, and then I had the same kind of independent variable, different, different, different ways of training uh, people, and I asked them, um, to what degree do you think this vignette, person is that vignette has major depressive disorder, you know, strongly agreed, strongly disagree. Now, their, um, their attitude about whether this is uh, major depressive disorder or not is a continuous variable. So most things you can find a way to measure that as a continuous variable to allow you to use um, these statistics because you have many more choices when you have continuous DVs than when you don't use continuous dependent variables. Okay, so uh, some variations. Uh, one, you might be looking at uh, two unrelated groups. And by unrelated groups, we mean that uh, you know a person's score in group A in no way influences a person's score in group B. And one way that happens is if they're not the same person, right? So it's not pre-test, post-test. Uh, you didn't get all levels of independent variable, so it's bet a between groups design. Um, and uh, you're not uh, comparing one twin to another twin. They're not related that way. Um, so again, score in what at one level of the IV in no way affects some another another score or observation in the other level of the independent variable. Uh, and the simplest way to look at that would be an independent groups t-test, uh, which you learned about uh, in statistics. Pretty straightforward. Uh, a lot of you will be doing that. Uh, easy to interpret, right? If there if there is a mean difference, you know, one's more than the other, one's less than. If there's not, then there's not a statistically significant difference between groups. And when that happens, uh, you didn't have uh, uh, evidence of an effect. Right? And again, we can only talk about effect if it wasn't experimental design. But you can use the things we'll talk about on this page, even if it's not an experimental design. If it's a quasi-experimental design, where you're still looking at group differences, but you didn't assign people to groups, like we're looking at um, gender differences, or differences between um, first year, second year, third year, and fourth year students. Right? We didn't assign you to be in a certain year, so we can't look at really effects. It's not an experiment, but if we're looking at group differences, we can still use these same statistical procedures. It's just the words you use to describe the results are a little different. You can't use the word effect. All you can say is there's a difference between these people based on this characteristic. Right? Um, okay, what about if you have two related groups? Right? That would be the pair groups t-test. Um, so most frequently this would be your, your pre-post pre uh, type designs where you measure them on the dependent variable. So I'm going to measure uh, all the participants level of depression, then I'll give them some intervention, and then I'll measure their depression again. So, you know, you're Somebody's depression score at time one is related to the depression score at time two, right? Somebody who is very depressed at time one, that's going to affect how depressed they are at time two in some way. Hopefully not completely. Hopefully my intervention had some effect, 
but still, they start high or they start low, that's going to influence where they end. So those, those scores are related, so the groups are related. Um, also, if you have any kind of um, uh, design where you're comparing people from one, one group to the other that are and they're related in some way, like if they're twins, uh, and you're looking at differences between twins, pair groups design, uh, or any kind of you know, within subjects uh, design, where somebody receives all levels of the independent variable. And again, pretty easy to uh, interpret. It's a little more complicated when you have more than two unrelated groups. Right? Um, so if I'm doing a, a drug study, and rather than just having um, no drug versus some drug, I want to look at uh, no drug versus low levels of the drug versus high levels of the drug. Now if I, if I use a fully between subjects design, so I assign a third in one to one group, a third to another group, a third to another group, now I have three groups, I have three means to compare, I can't just do a t-test with that, right? Because t-tests look at, you know, two things, A versus B. Now I've got three. Uh, so I've got to use something called ANOVA, or Univariate Analysis of Variance. Right? So the question I think comes to mind is, well, why not do just do multiple t-tests, right? Compare group one to group two with t-tests, group one to group three, and group two to group three, right? And then you would have uh, your answer. Uh, and there, that might be logically sound. However, it's not typically done that way because of concern about family-wise error. Right? Family-wise error uh, is uh, recognition of the phenomenon that the likelihood of making a type 1 error increases with the more tests you do. So each time you conduct a test using null hypothesis significance testing, there's some chance, we don't know how much, but less than 0.05 usually, but some chance of making a type 1 error. The more times I do a test, the more overall the likelihood of making type 1 error increases. Right? Uh, and that's just a simple probability, right? Uh, every year the, the Spurs have a chance to win the NBA championship. Right? Over the course of uh, 50 years, so if I add all their chances up, at least once in those 50 years, the probability of them winning is higher than their probability of winning in any one given year on average. Right? So the more chances you have of doing something, the more likely it is that sometime this one thing is going to happen, in this case, an error. And so to protect against family-wise error, or uh, inflation of the error rate, makes you that term uh, thrown around, to prevent, you know, the like, to reduce the likelihood, you can't prevent, to reduce the likelihood of making a type 1 error, you can do this uh, a node which is kind of an omnibus test, compares all the means at once. So it's one test to see if there is uh, some difference among groups related to the independent variable, wh which is nice. The drawback is um, you can't stop there because if you have a significant ANOVA, so we have our one groups one, two, and three, and it's significant, yay! Uh, you know our independent variable had an effect. There's some difference. Well, what what was the effect? Was are all those groups different? Maybe, maybe not, right? It could be that all the groups are statistically significantly different from each other, or it could be that there's just, you know, one group difference between two groups that's driving or creating the significance no, right? So you have to do post hoc tests. Remember that stats? Um, you know, your, your Tukey uh, test, uh, Chaffe, uh, kind of Bonfroni correction, where all those, those terms. So you have to go, you can, after you have a significant no, you can go back and say, okay, now, I do these pairwise comparisons, post hoc analysis pairwise comparisons to see the group one different from group two, the two different from three, and then one different from three. And the, th and the thinking is, if you only do those comparisons if you got a, a, a significant ANOVA, you're reducing the likelihood of type 1 error because you already have some evidence that there is an effect versus going ahead and just doing all the pairwise comparisons without a significant ANOVA. Um, and there's probably some something to be said uh, uh, for that. Um, okay. So if you do an ANOVA, uh, which you have to do if you have more than two groups, you have to follow it up with post hoc tests, pairwise comparisons. Now to add another wrinkle to this, we have something called ANCOVA, right? Analysis of covariance. Um, and this is when
you want to compare uh, uh, groups, right? How do these two groups differ on some dependent variable? And then you want to uh, look at that difference after accounting for some other variable that's related to the dependent variable. Um, sometimes you'll hear people say, um, and COVA will be used to uh, a covariate, which is what the COVA stands for, right? Uh, a covariate will be used to control for uh, pre existing differences in blah, blah, blah. So you might see somebody looking at a study, um, looking at, uh, you know, you know, does uh, what neighborhood you live in, uh, is that related to education level? So uh, neighborhood would be an independent variable, education level is a DV. Uh, you say, well, um, I know that income is related to uh, education level, and I want to uh, account for that, and I want to control for the income level. So they'll use uh, income as a covariate. They'll say, okay, uh, are there differences in these neighborhoods on education level after accounting for, after controlling for differences uh, in income level? That is an inappropriate use of ANCOVA. You can't control for um, income level. What it does statistically is um, act as if, treats, gets, shifts the numbers to look like as if everybody uh, were equal in income, what would their uh, education level be, and then compare them. But their income level isn't the same. And you're going to have some distorted conclusions if you use ANCOVA like this. So you'll see it done, but I'm telling you, uh, don't, don't do that. Uh, so what is an appropriate use for ANCOVA? Really, the, the most appropriate use is if you're looking, um, instead of doing uh, repeated measures in ANCOVA, you use ANCOVA for looking at uh, comparing uh, two groups uh, and using uh, pretest scores as the covariate. That's an appropriate use uh, of ANCOVA. Um, what if you have uh, more than two related groups? So again, thinking about back to the pair groups t-test uh, type thing with two related groups. So remember we got pre, post, that's time one, time two. What if I want to look at time one, time two, and time three? Right. So pre, post, and six month follow up. Now again, I would have to do multiple pair groups t-tests to look at that, which would lead to um, inflation of the error rate and the family-wise error rate, likelihood of committing at least one type 1 error in one of those tests. So to protect against that, I could do repeated measures of NOVA, which would look at, okay, overall, across these three points in time, was there a difference? But again, just like ANOVA, you have to follow up with uh, post hoc analyses that do pairwise comparisons comparing each, each time level. Um, and really, uh, you can use repeated measures of NOVA with, with any within subject design that has uh, three or more levels. Uh, so if you had, you know, you're doing a drug study and you have each subject take zero uh, milligrams uh, measure the DV, 20 milligrams measure the DV, 30 milligrams measure the DV, and look for differences across levels of the drug, um, then that would also you would also use the repeated measures ANOVA uh, for that. Okay. Okay, so all those tests were looking um, for differences um, between groups on a continuous DV. So what if you are interested in looking at a discrete dependent variable? Uh, well, in that case, you'd use something called the chi-square test of independence. Remember that little funny looking X with the uh, superscript 2 with chi-square? Uh, an example would be if we want to know, you know is there a difference between uh, men and women on their preferred method of discipline? 
spanking versus timeout. Right? I mean, I could look at that using continuous DV asking, you know, how li how much do you um, approve of spanking? How much do you approve of timeout? Right. So then I'd have two dependent variables, uh, and I would I could do those uh, separate. I had to do a t test uh, looking at it between men and women on approval of spanking, and t test uh, on between men and men and women looking at approval of timeout. So if I want to look at okay, not I don't want to look at levels of both. I just want to know which one do you like better. If you were forced to choose, which one would you choose? And are there differences in that choice? So now that's a discrete DV, and I can uh, use chi-square for that. Uh, and this chart is kind of I put up to kind of uh, remind you of what chi-square does, right? Uh, it compares uh, expected frequencies to observed frequencies, right? So this is all about how many people fall in certain categories. So if there are um, 20 women in the study, then it's expected that 10 uh, would uh, say spanking and 10 would say timeout. Right? And ex the expected here is based on if there was no relationship between gender and discipline uh, preference. Right? And that expectation of no relationship is also called the null hypothesis, right? So the expected values are based on the null hypothesis. And the same for men. If there were 20 men uh, and there was no relationship between these variables, you'd expect uh, an equal number of men to prefer spanking uh, to timeout. And then I have some the O's in here are a, a speculated hypothetical uh, set of data we possibly could observe. So it could have happened that we had uh, four women, four of the 20 women uh, endorsed spanking, the other 16 endorsed timeout. Uh, for the men, 18 endorsed spanking and two endorsed timeout. And you kind of eyeball that and say, okay, well that looks like uh, a, a pattern where men were more likely to endorse spanking um, than timeout and women were more likely to endorse timeout than spanking. But chi-square can tell you, okay, is that pattern statistically significant, right? Is it statistically significant, statistically significantly uh, different from the pattern you observe? Is it different from what you would have observed if the null were true? Okay. Um, so kind of a quick and dirty on my chi-square test of independence. And um, so far, we've been talking about if you just had one dependent variable. And you think, well, if I had more than one dependent variable, I would do more than one test. And frequently, uh, that may be the right, uh, right thing to do. But sometimes, you want to know, is there a difference between groups on more than one dependent variable? And you want to know about some combination of, of those dependent variables. If that's the case, you use some, some type of multivariate analysis. And for group differences, it's a multivariate analysis of variance, or MANOVA. Right? So this is asking the question, do the groups differ on some linear combination of the dependent variables? So maybe if I want to know, I want to compare people who, um, after uh, going through a treatment program, and I follow up uh, a year later, uh, people who, who suffered a relapse versus those who, who didn't. Right. So there's my kind of uh, quasi-independent variable. Uh, my two groups, relapse versus no relapse. And so okay, well, do, do those two groups differ? based on some combination of variables. Let's say based on, you know, uh, years of use, how many years they used before they were sober, uh, number of previous relapses, uh, number of substances they uh, have used or abused in the past, right? I could combine all those variables uh, statistically, kind of as a numeric for me. So um, think about um, uh, an equation where you say, okay, well, if uh, the years are most important, uh, I have like 0.5 times the years uh, of sobriety plus 0.2 times number of previous relapse plus 0.3 times uh, number of substances used, and you know some co that kind of combination of those variables yields some number, and that number distinguishes or discriminates between the two groups, and that's what uh, MANOVA um, tries uh, tries to get at. And again, kind of like ANOVA, it's a big uh, omnibus test. So if you get a significant um, uh, MANOVA, you, it'll say, okay, there is a difference uh, between these two groups on this combination uh, of variables. Uh, and we have the same old questions. Why use it? One would be uh, if you want to reduce the number, the life of type 1 errors. Here. You have mul interest in multiple DVs, and you don't want to do a lot of. Uh, you don't do a lot of t-tests or even a lot of uh, ANOVAs if you have multiple levels. Um, so you want to control for that type 1 error rate. Uh, 
And so you use MANOVA as an omnibus test, so as a starting point. Okay, I'll do this, and then if the MANOVA is significant, I'll look at each of those DVs separately. I would argue, uh, and uh, many kind of statistical nerds would argue that that would not be an appropriate use of MANOVA, right? If your questions really are univariate in nature, and that means like, if really you're interested, well, I want to know, um, does the number of years You, uh, uh, you you had in sobriety, does that distinguish between these groups? And I want to know, does the number of substances used, does that distinguish between groups? And if those are separate questions for you, those are univariate questions, then don't do MANOVA. Do multiple t-tests or multiple ANOVAs and then figure out the type 1 error rate some other way. There are ways to deal with that. Um, only use MANOVA if you have kind of a theoretical rationale, or if, if you're really interested in the combination of those variables. And one thing that one thing that MANOVA does for you in terms of the combination of variables is it gives you some sense of the relative importance of uh, those variables. Which one is the most predictive? So when you get uh, uh, do a multivariate analysis of variance with the example we have, one of those uh, variables will emerge as the most significant predictor. Right? They'll kind of fight out for variance. Okay, which one accounts for most of the differences between uh, relapse and non-relapse? And uh, there'll be kind of the beta weight assigned to it that you can compare across um, your your uh, your DVs, your predictors. Say, okay, which one emerged as the most important? And if that's part of your question, then MANOVA is is, is appropriate. If really you want to know, just you know, do they differ on this? Do they differ on this? And do they differ on this? Then do do more do more than one univariate analysis. But if you're interested in the actual combination, and which one's more important, or how do these things uh, compare each other in, in terms of uh, some combination uh, of factors? Then, yeah, go ahead and use uh, Mano. Okay. But again, you should have a theoretical rationale for doing any type of multivariate analysis as opposed to multiple univariate analysis. Um, so now we move on to a, a different way of thinking from looking at different group differences to looking at uh, linear relationships between continuous variables. Right? So now we're, we're moving away from experimental and quasi-experimental type studies to correlational type studies. So we're looking at just uh, two variables. Of course, you'd use probably some sort of bivariate correlation. One example of which would be the, the Pearson R, the Pearson product moment correlation. Okay. And, and there are other um, correlational statistics for different variations. Like if you're looking at a uh, person among ordinal data, you know, who, you know where you finished in the race, how that correlates with amount of um, uh, time you, you spent training, you know that you wouldn't use a Pearson R for that. There's a different statistic for that, but it's still uh, the same basic thing. The math is a little different. Um, but anytime you have two variables doing correlational stuff, you have uh, one variable that you typically identify as the predictor, and one you typically identify as the criterion. So the the predictor is the variable you're predicting with, and the criterion is usually some outcome you're trying to predict. So you know if your question is you know is alcohol use Correlated with number of falls, which one is your predictor with which criteria? Most would say, well, alcohol use is the predictor, and I'm trying to predict number of falls with al alcohol use based on alcohol use, so the based on thing is the predictor. The outcome is how many times you fall down, that's the criteria. Um, but again, this is fairly subjective because if you flip it and say, okay, well, if I want to go out um, and I, I want to see, um, can I figure out how, how drunk people are by how much uh, they're falling down? And so now I'm using number of times you fall down to try to predict how much alcohol somebody's using. Right? So I'll measure the number of times they fall and then go get a blood alcohol level. Now I've switched with one predictor, which is criterion. But uh, kind of for yourself and your study, you will identify which one you see as the predictor and which one you see as uh, the criterion. Keeping that in mind, uh, sometimes you can have multiple predictors and one criterion variable. And so if you're trying to predict uh, one thing, and that one thing is continuous, so uh, kind of like with a relapse thing, but instead of yes relapse, uh, no relapse, maybe we're trying to predict um, how many days following exiting a program you maintain sobriety. Right? So now that's not a discrete variable, it's continuous. Zero days, one days, all up to theoretically an infinite number of days. Right? So it's a continuous variable. Uh, 
Uh, so I'm trying to predict that continuous criterion using the multiple predictors, you know, uh, how many subsets you used, how, uh, how long you'd used prior to sobriety. I can enter all those things as predictors and see uh, what combination of those things predicts that outcome variable, and you'd use multiple regression uh, to do this. And very similar to mathematically and um, kind of conceptually to what we talked about before with um, multivariate analysis of variance. It's <laughs> very similar mathematically. The difference being, rather than predicting, uh, you know, uh, this kind of discrete group status, A or B, now we're predicting some continuous uh, uh, criterion variable. So again, you use this when you're interested in the combination, the linear combination of those predictive variables. And usually it's if you want to know, you know which one is, is most important. And if you don't have any real good idea of which one's most important, you do something called stepwise multiple regression. And contrary to the way the name sounds, you enter all the variables at once, and then you let the, the statistical software sort out mathematically which one is the most important predictor, which one emerges and accounts for the most variance. And then the next one will emerge. Okay, after that one takes up all the variance, it can take up what uh, what variable uh, takes up the uh, the remaining amount of variance the best, so on and so forth. Um, so you might do that, but you can also use hierarchical regression if you have kind of theoretical reasons uh, to say, okay, no, I want to look at the relationship among these variables in predicting uh, relapse, but I'm going to enter them in this order. So you, if you have a specified order, then you can use hierarchical regression. So if you want to know, okay, well. Right now, people are using, um, you know, number of years pre-sobriety as as their um, decision tool. So I want to say, okay, after I'm going to put that in first, because I want to know how much variance it accounts for. I want to force it in first. How much does it account for? And then how well do other things predict after that one's in there? Um, so with multiple regression, there's multiple ways um, to do it. There are even more twists uh, beyond this. But again, with any multivariate analysis. You only do it if the question in your mind, the theoretical question you're looking at, is multivariate um, in nature. Okay, and then slightly more complicated, not really than that, would be if you have multiple predictors and multiple criterion variables. Uh, for that, you would use something like canonical correlation. <laughs> and this is when you're looking at linear combinations of sets of variables. So maybe if I want to look at um, therapy outcome and uh, therapist quality. But I have like three things I'm interested in measuring therapist quality. And those could be like low, low level of education, um, amount of uh, uh, training on a particular um, uh, uh, treatment, um, number of clients seen, whatever. I've got multiple continuous things there. And then I have multiple outcomes that I'm interested in, uh, therapy outcomes in terms of uh, level of symptom reduction, uh, number of days missed at work, whatever. If I want to look at all those variables at once, I can use canonical correlation and it will create these um, uh, kind of like factors and factor analysis. And you've heard about that. It'll form linear combinations uh, of these variables uh, and, then, and then tell you the strength of relationship between these um, constructed variables. Uh, most of you probably won't I uh, won't use that, but I just mentioned it here so you, you know what else is, is out there. Um, okay, so the ones we talked about are probably all the tests um, most of you w would use, uh, and certainly what you would use for, for this class, but there are dozens and dozens more tests and even whole different ways of testing. So these are kind of the, the, the big ones in the field to know about. So be aware that there are lots of other things out there and there are also lots, uh, lots of other variations. Um, which hopefully you, you'll talk about in your grad staff class, or have already talked about. Okay, let's move on to talking about uh, interpreting results. Um, so, currently, uh, we're still relying on the, the NHST, the null hypothesis, null hypothesis significance testing model. Right? We've talked about um, what that means, right? where you have this null hypothesis where there's no effect, and we're testing whether or not um, the data supports that it's true that there's no effect, right, which is kind of backwards, and we hope to reject the null um, and conclude that the groups are different. I'm talking about um, any kind of experiment study, uh, and we hope to achieve statistical significance, right? So that 
and we're doing uh, you know a t test or a nova we're looking at the effect of one variable on, on another we're comparing groups we hope for a statistically significant difference between groups let's get two groups it's three groups a statistically significant difference among groups right? sometimes you even see a statistically significant effect more appropriate to say a statistically significant difference because the the statistics only test the difference. You kind of rationally conclude an effect based on the difference, but the statistics won't, won't test for an effect per se. So just don't make that make that distinction in your mind. Um, one note about uh, interpreting um, statistically significant findings: uh, whenever you use uh, SPSS or SAS or Literal or whatever software package you're using, um, if you were to collect data and analyze it, you know. It, Usually, it generates some p-value, right, which is what we rely on to tell us if something was statistically significant or not. Uh, and the p-value uh, is a value, right, and it's not it's not the probability of a type one error. That's how it's sometimes interpreted. It's not what it is. Right? You, you compare the p-value to uh, alpha, which you set a priori before the study, and you want the p-value to be lower than alpha. If it is, then you reject the null hypothesis, and you have a statistically significant finding, whether that's a difference or a relationship, whatever. Uh, well what the p-value is, it's the upper level of the probability of making a type 1 error if you reject the null in that given study. Right? So it's kind of upper level of a conditional probability. Right? And we can't say it's the, it's the probability because we need to know the actual probability that the null were true to know the probability of making a type 1 error. And we, we can't uh, know that. If we designed a good study, it's probably not very high, so the p-value is as probable as uh, it, it could be. So it's less likely than p that we've made a type 1 error, that if we say these two things are different, that in the real world they are different. Okay. Um, so just kind of, in, when you interpret p, that's all it means is yes, no, significant, uh, statistical significance. It in no way tells you the level of statistical significance, uh, which is a uh, mistake um, made by some uh, professional researchers. You know, if you have p equals 0.01 versus p equals 0.0001, the 0001, that finding isn't any more statistically significant than the other one. It's not levels of significance when looking at p-values. It's just yes, no. It's a dichotomous decision. So, so don't ever say more statistically significant when talking about p-values. Uh, in terms of the criticisms of null hypothesis seamless testing, uh, which, you, which you read about, um, one thing that it has happened uh, is um, there's a bias uh, in our field uh, among uh, publishers and, and researchers uh, to not publish studies that don't have statistically significant findings. Right? So if you don't get that p less than 0.05 or less than 0.01, whatever you set alpha at, your study doesn't get published. And that's a problem. If it doesn't get published, nobody knows you did it. If nobody knows you did it, then they'll try the same thing. right? So we have this thing called the desk drawer phenomenon where if people's desk drawers in their offices are filled with these studies that nobody knows about where you know, we're trying to say, okay, well, you know, does um, this treatment work in terms of creating differences between, uh, does this treatment work to reduce depression? You know, if 20 people studied it and didn't find anything, and then one person studied it and did find something, so one person will get published, and the other 20 won't. Now, if 20 other people found it, uh, that it didn't work, then your one study that got published might be the result of a type 1 error. Right? So we're, we're kind of uh, um, skewing uh, the scientific knowledge by not publishing null findings. Uh, and that's because if we just rely on uh, P, then yes, no significant, well, not significant, that's bad. And if we were to get away from that and look at the whole study, there might be less of a bias against uh, publishing studies uh, that report null findings or findings where there's not a statistically significant effect. Um, another criticism uh, is that, um, again, it tells you just a simple dichotomy, it's this yes-no thing, and doesn't tell you the strength of uh, an effect uh, or of a relationship, which is usually what we're most interested in. And related to that, in theory, the null is always false. Right? Looking at two groups that had different experiences, really, it's pretty unlikely that they're exactly the same on the dependent variable. Right? If they're different 
in truth, capital T truth, if they're different by 0 .0001, then the null is false. And so if the null, if the null is practically false in every situation, why are we wasting our time with deciding whether or not to reject the null? Just always reject it. And so the null being false may not be that big a deal, other than the bigger the effect, the more likely you should be to reject the null. That's kind of how the thinking goes. Uh, nonetheless, uh, not everyone is satisfied with null hypothesis in this testing, and it certainly um, uh, won't disappear anytime soon. It probably shouldn't disappear, but it shouldn't stand alone. It already has been um, due to kind of criticisms. People have changed the way they're doing things, uh, and they're basically trying to improve upon it rather than uh, reflect it. And the way to improve upon it would be to uh, report effect sizes. So an effect size is a measure of the strength of the effect, right, or the relationship. Depending if you're doing kind of uh, group differences or correlation stuff. You can, either way, you can calculate an effect size. And the effect size is unrelated to, well, whether or not you get statistical significance doesn't determine the effect size. Larger effect sizes will typically lead to uh, more like are more likely to be statistically significant, but not necessarily if you don't have a lot of participants. Right? So if you have three participants, you could have a huge effect size, but it may not be a statistically significant difference because you didn't have enough power. So effect size is somewhat independent of statistical significance. They're related, but not they're not the same thing. Uh, the other thing that people are being encouraged to report would be uh, conference intervals. Um, so if you have these two means, um, you know, 10.1 uh, and 9.8, creating confidence intervals around those uh, gives people kind of a visual idea of how different they really are. Right? So if 10.1 and 9.8 are your uh, your mean differences, and you have big confidence intervals, so the 10.1 is, is probably somewhere the real value, right, within the confidence interval, is somewhere between uh, 8 and 11, and for the 9.8 confidence interval is uh, the real value there is somewhere between you know seven and ten and a half. Well, okay, these two means are probably not different. But if you had small confidence intervals, so if it were um, you know your 10.1 mean, uh, the confidence interval is okay. Somewhere we're pretty confident that it's somewhere between um, 10.15 and 10.05, and the 9.8 is somewhere between 9.85 and 9.75. Now those same two means look more different. They probably are more different because we have more confidence about um, about those values. And that depends on the variability in, in your data set, which we'll, we won't get into here. The confidence intervals give you kind of a visual representation of how different um, two things uh, really are. Uh, the third method for improving null hypothesis significant testing would be meta-analyses. Uh, it can be used within one study uh, if multiple um, experiments are conducted within a study typically used across studies to combine uh, results of studies. So that's kind of the thing about if you pulled all those things out of the desk drawer and those things got published, even if they weren't statistically significant, they would report effect sizes. And meta-analysis goes back and says, okay, if I look at all the studies and I kind of average the effect sizes, and this is a very loose word, a, a loose use of the word average, but conceptually average the effect sizes, all the studies that have been done what's the typical effect size when comparing uh, you know, treatment A to treatment B. Okay, and that's what, what meta-analysis can do. And so it takes advantage of um, all those studies that maybe weren't statistically significant and says, well, even, they weren't, even if they didn't have this kind of um, p-value appropriate uh, that was appropriate uh, or uh, you know, past the threshold, the information there is still important it needs to be combined with other information. Uh, and then the last way of in improving uh, null hypothesis is testing, which, um, depending on what kind of subfield you're working in, will be embraced in more or less uh, degrees, because uh, it's really an, a really different way of thinking about statistics, which would be a uh, Bayesian statistics or Bayesian uh, method uh, of analyzing data, uh, which <coughs> relies on prior probability of the null being true to get more precise confidence intervals. And it's um, it's really kind of uh, conceptually distinct from NHST, and so a lot of people aren't that comfortable with it. But uh, and it can be used as completely as an alternative, or you can do both, right? And then you can kind of compare um, the uh, look at how uh, 
you know, how does your interpretation of the data uh, change, if at all, from using one approach or the other? So it can be added to no hypothesis um, significant testing. Okay, let's talk now about um, what goes in the last two sections of your research proposal. Um, after the, so you have uh, title page, abstract, introduction, met <coughs> method, and then a data analysis section. Now, typically, if you're writing um, a paper about a completed project, this would be called the results section. So you can kind of think of it as a quasi result section, but I'll kind of change the title here to data analysis. And so the, the title I'd recommend putting you know, um, at the head of the section is data analysis or data analyses. <coughs> because you don't really have results, all you are going to have is a plan for how to um, look at the data and uh, what you expect to happen. So, really two pieces of information to have here. One, what test or tests uh, you would use. Um, so a sentence you might have would be something like this. Uh, a univariate analysis of variance, ANOVA, will be used to determine if participants' scores on the BDI2 differ depending on what type of therapy they receive, CBT versus Gestalt. So you can see that my independent variable here is type of therapy, my DV uh, is scores on depression, and in the results section, I talk very. I don't say, uh, you know, do they differ in uh, level of depression. I talk very specifically about the numbers. Do they differ in their scores on this measure? Right. In the discussion section, other places in the paper, I'll talk about, you know, do they differ in level of depressive symptoms or do they differ in depression? But the results is very kind of mathematically, very kind of specific oriented. Um, and if I had uh, three groups here, you know, CBT versus Gestalt versus person-centered, I'd probably follow up with a sentence saying something like, um, post hoc analyses uh, uh, would, will then be used to determine uh, which means differ significantly from each other. Right. Simple as that. So what tests you would use, and then what result you would expect. Again, at the level of the number. And you don't have to make up numbers, but just kind of say what, where the numbers would come from. So and it's expected that participants who receive CBT will score lower on the BDI2 than will participants who receive Gestalt therapy. And so I mean, I'm, not, I'm not saying that here that they'll be less depressed, because right? I'm just talking about numbers. I'm saying they'll get lower scores on this instrument, which I'm using to measure the dependent variable. Okay? Uh, and that's about it. So a pretty, pretty brief section uh, for, for data analysis. Uh, for most of you. Some people may have slightly more complicated stuff, but most of you, this will be pretty uh, pretty simple. And then the discussion section, go ahead and call it discussion, just like you would in a typical paper. Uh, but in a completed paper, it would look a little different, right? Because typically this is where um, you're helping the reader make sense of your pattern of findings and then providing a context for these findings. A little different for the proposal because you don't have any findings to, to you know, help make sense of. But you still do some of the same stuff. So what you do in the proposal, a couple of things. Uh, explain the expected results in plain English. Right? So now I'm kind of saying the same thing I said in the results, but using um, not talking about the test. So it's expected that participants that receive CBT will be less depressed than participants that receive Gestalt therapy. Right? So now instead of saying that they'll differ in BDI score, I'm interpreting what BDI score is for the reader, what I think it is. I think it indicates the level of depression, so I'll say they're less depressed. So in plain English, like you're planning a grandma, what do you expect to happen? Which is probably very similar to what you had way back up um, at the end of the intro when talking about your hypothesis. Right? Then, uh, so that'll be brief, and then a section that will hopefully be uh, larger will be uh, talk about anything that might limit or qualify the interpretation <coughs> of your results. Right? So, so um, the study, you know, so I'm going to say, uh, it's kind of this will happen, <coughs> and then I'm going to say, however, you know, if the groups uh, differ, it might not be because CBT is more effective than Gestalt, and here are the reasons why that might not be true. So, like, here are the reasons my conclusion might be wrong if I found what I hoped to find. And you might say stuff like, um, you know, it, it's possible that uh, because of the sample I used, um, uh, everybody in my group will be uh, have really low levels of depression to start with, um, and Gestalt therapy is, is more effective for treating higher, more severe levels of depression, 
and so this isn't a fair test. You know, whatever, you know, it could be things, problems with your sample, problems with your method, and it's not to say a problem, but there are limitations. You can't design the perfect study for to make your conclusions apply to everybody and be perfect. So you're going to have some things in there that you can criticize. So try to think about what would somebody else criticize about your study if you tried to make a claim. Like if you tried to say, okay, I've, I've proved, and you would never say this, but I've proved that this has an effect on this. If somebody tried to rip you apart on that, what would they say? So identify those things, and as many as you can. You know, I would say aim for uh, at least two, try, try to find three. And then, if you can, counter these things. So, you know, uh, the sample will maybe not be representative, but then hopefully you can say, however, um, and then counter that with, uh, maybe you might say, you know, the goal of this current study wasn't to have a representative sample because we wanted to find out if it was possible for one therapy to be superior to another, and future studies should be done to, uh, if the same results are found, uh, to replicate, this, to see if this, this effect replicates with other people, right, with samples, other types of samples. Right? So address the concerns that you raise yourself. Right? Um, <coughs> excuse me. So uh, at least two, try, try to do three if you can, of limitations um, to your study. So criticize your own study and then answer the criticism if possible. If not, just kind of acknowledge that yes, that is a limitation that you know, can't be addressed in the current study. Uh, and then the, the last thing would be potential implications, applications of findings. And again, you don't have findings, so here you're talking about if you find what you expect to find. So let me, sorry, let me back up for one second. Um, in the previous section, the limitations, one thing that might help you is you can think about, okay, um, and if you want to think of one limitation, okay, if I find what I expect to find, and I conclude this, uh, it might not be true because of this. You can also think the other way. If I fail to find a difference, right, so if I get, if I were to get uh, no difference between groups, it might not be true that the variable doesn't have an effect, right, I could, and you could say, and then you can kind of address reasons for that. That could happen because the study may not have sufficient power. It could be that the independent variable wasn't strongly uh, manipulated strongly enough. Right? So that's kind of another source for that section of the paper if you're having a hard time thinking of uh, limitations. So limitations, qualifications of conclusions of an effect or lack of an effect. Okay. So after you do that, the last thing you go down to is potential implications, applications, findings. And again, you don't have findings, so it's here just focus on if the expected of pattern of results is found. So right, um, for this example study, uh, if and um, if in the study it is found that um, clients treated with CBT uh, exhibit less depressive, fewer depressive symptoms um, than clients uh, receiving gestalt therapy, then and then you want to say, you know, what should be done? So what should people do differently based on that finding? If if you found it. What are the practical applications of your finding? How should the world act differently? You know, teachers, therapists, parents, police officers, soldiers, decision makers, whoever. You know, what's the application of your finding? And then, um, if you discussed any theories back in the introduction, you can bring those up here too and say, uh, if I, if this is found, this would be consistent with blah blah blah. And you can cite whatever theory you talked about before. You kind of repeat some stuff from the from the intro. Um, down here. Uh, and that'll be it for uh, the discussion section. Um, <coughs> for this section, try to get um, uh, at least a page. Um, two would be better, but uh, at least a page uh, with most of it being kind of limitation stuff and then the implication application. The other thing. Okay? Uh,